All right, we are driving down a typical suburban neighborhood, and what do you see? Lawns, green lawns. And if you've ever lived or visited one of these neighborhoods, you may have thought that there's that's just the way it is, right? Lawns, expanses of lawns. But what we're gonna tell you is that not only are there other ways, but there are better ways. And the way of doing the lawns is actually the wrong way to do it. So we're gonna get into this right now. All right, so this is Gwen Whitaker's lawn, but it's not a lawn. If you look and compare her yard to everyone else's, we saw they are just green carpets over there. And over here is a mixture of what looks to me like just flowering plants, like perennials and things. So I wanna find out why Gwen did this, why it's beneficial, and why maybe you should think about doing this in your own yard as well. So I'm Gwen Whitaker. I appreciate Mike videotaping me. I wanted to share a little bit about uh, native um, yards and why I got started on this path. I'm the owner of the Green Fair Organic Cafe Restaurant. And I, as I started learning more about food, I recognized that organic is gonna be better. And so I started cleaning up my entire environment. So not only my food, but skin products, things that I put in my house. And then if you think about everything that goes out in your yard, so all the uh, synthetic fertilizers, the pesticides, the herbicides that go into most uh, yards, they cause uh, problems with the Chesapeake Bay, you have the uh, nitrogen surpluses. Actually in Virginia right now, it's illegal to put nitrogen down on your lawn until you've had your lawn tested. Um, because of the problems with the uh, with the Chesapeake Bay. So from what you're telling us, it sounds like, in a way, these green lawns, not to be too loud for the neighbors, are poisoning the environment almost. Uh, it looks cool, right? If you're doing it, if you're doing all the work, which is a tremendous amount of work, tremendous amount of water, and everything, it looks like a green carpet, but yeah. it's not without its problems, right? Yeah, so I'm not going to criticize the neighbor's yards, but what I <laughs> hope to do is show sort of a better a better way. Um, I think when I was growing up, you didn't have all of the pesticides and chemicals that were going into green lawns. I remember right. walking in front right. of my dad with the lawnmower picking the dandelions. Weeds. It's mostly, well, right, what, it was green. And a weed is anything that nobody wants, right? It, it, it probably has benefits, but people just want to see it. A weed is a plant whose right? purpose hasn't been discovered yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so most yeah. weeds actually have a lot of... Uh, benefit. If you look at dandelions, you know they're used yeah. for cancer research and yeah. uh, cancer treatment. Um, uh, the um, plantain that you see is full of vitamin C, vitamin E. So most um, plants, people just haven't taken the time to understand what the benefits are. So okay. we've sort of lost contact with the benefit, the the miracle of plants. So that this helps to, sorry, this helps to regain that contact. Then. It does. Um, so what I wanted to do was create an oasis in, and, and basically show that uh, if you're creating an oasis for the insects and the, the bees and the birds, uh, in this is a quarter acre uh, lawn and surrounded. with a homeowners association, and it, it's a living it's a living yard. It's full of um, activity. You can see the, the bumblebee that's move. on this. Oh, uh, these are plants that you'll probably see a lot of times in the woods. The, this is the blue mist, mist flower, uh, cons, concilium. Uh, these are black-eyed Susans, which is sort of a common name. Um, this is a butterfly weed. Uh, so if you talk about the butterflies and the bees, you know, all of these are our pollinators. These are what create our food. If you don't have pollinators, you don't have food and people die. Um, this really tall plant is called a, ver a purple verbena. There's a purple aster sort of to the right of that. The red plant is a, a, a cardinal flower. It's a bee balm, right? Is that what that's called? It's called a cardinal flower. Oh, it's different. Okay, it's different. Because I've yeah, seen bee, bee balms. balms are okay. going to grow closer to the ground. Um, and I'm going to show you the milkweed because this was sort of how I got started. I never planted these. They just came up and I didn't pull them up. But if you see this caterpillar, that's a monarch. Um, caterpillar that is going to be looking each monarch butterfly will find one milkweed plant and put a um, chrysalis on the plant so that when it emerges from the caterpillar that particular chrysalis, chrysalis uh, butterfly that emerges will feed on that butterfly plant or on the milkweed. Um, if you see there's little red Let's see, look at this pot over here. You see that's filled with the red yeah. bugs? Yep. Those are actually butterfly weed bugs. <laughs> it's easy to remember, um, but they're 
very, um, all, all the uh, insects are going to be beneficial to um, uh, plant life because they're, they're pollinating. So as I learned more about uh, food from the restaurant and the benefits of organic, I started extending that to plants in my landscape. And um, I've, I started the Master Gardener program that's an extension of Fairfax County. So I've been doing that for seven years now. It consists of education and then uh, public service. So in the winter, you're taking classes and in the uh, summer, you're at plant clinics helping people to learn not to poison their food that they're growing in their yard. Um, and so it's really just rethinking things. Um, so one of the ladies that did a presentation in the Master Gardener actually did the design of my yard. She's an expert in native plants. So I hired her to do a layout of all native plants, which means that they were indigenous to the United States before the Europeans came over. Um, that's basically what the definition of a native plant is. Okay. Um, there's a lot of things that were brought over with the Chinese, like stilt grass and Jap Japanese wine flower that are invasives. So there are a lot of other things that are uh, that are native but can still be invasive. I have a question. Um, actually, I can flip this around. So from what you're saying, the plants here are not just randomly put down. There's an entire plan for all of this and it's intentional and you're trying to keep out the bad and bring in the good, is that right? Yeah, so there really is no bad. I think Mother Nature has her own plans for things and okay. you can start out with a plan, which is what I did, which is to put down sort of structure of um, something that was gonna be attractive, uh, not only to the insects and the bees, but also to the neighbors. So it's flowering at different, right. different right. parts of the year and um, different things are gonna be blooming. The, purple aster just started blooming the cone flowers which I encourage everybody to Where are they? Can we walk yard. over to those? They're yeah. like a bright mm -hmm. pink. They sort of turn brown but the I cool see. thing now yeah. is that the goldfinches are here almost every day in the afternoon and the goldfinches are actually eating the seeds. If you have, actually there's one over there, Mike, if you can see not near the tree. See oh yeah, there's purple. purple. I see. Yeah, so those haven't, those haven't turned brown yet. I have a little bit of goldenrod here. This creates a lot of allergies for different uh, different people, but um, a lot of these things are things that if you're walking through the woods, you're gonna see sort of scattered around. I've got like an intense version of these things. And then mother nature has started to add her own her own thing. Okay, like what, what, what's an example of that? Um, we, we can come up here. And so there's another concept that I've started integrating, which is something called foodscaping, which is basically how do you put food into your uh, own environment, so you're growing food. So if you see, this is all um, curly kale, and I've got um, cabbage, um, which is actually, oh, I'm sorry, that's, um, that's, a, that's a dinosaur kale over there, like, like the long, Strings. This yeah. is, um, gosh, I'm forgetting what that is. It's, but anyway, it's extremely, so many varieties. It's, yeah. a, it's extremely attractive to the bugs. You can see that they've, see. they've eaten it, which <laughs> yeah. I'm actually okay with. That means that it's a, a living yard and something's um, getting benefit from that. So some things kind of came in on their own. This is a plantain here. I think that maybe, I'm actually not sure the type of plantain, but it's the leaves are edible. Um, I'm going to show you some purple violets. This is another uh, native plant that has just sort of snuck in. This is actually, you see the blue flower, that's called a day flower. Um, that's come in. So I usually let things go for a bit and then sort of see what comes out of them before I, before I pull things out. Some things you asked about invasives. If I see stilt grass, then I um, pull that out. You can see I've got some tomato plants in here. Um, so tomato plants. I actually had some corn growing up against my house. Um, I, have, I have a question. Um, uh -huh. We're in the mid-Atlantic right now, so you said stilt grass is invasive. Does, can you show us what that looks like, or is that pretty yeah, obvious? You're going to see, uh, say, Japanese stilt grass. Let's see, I, I think I, I, it's one of those things that I constantly pull off when I see it. But so this is what Japanese stilt grass looks like. It's this... Um, this plant right here, it's very easy to pull up. It grows from a central and then it spreads sort of like a, um, like a vine. 
and it's extremely invasive. You can go through almost any um, area and see um, just that may be the only thing that you, you see. And the, the deer don't eat it. Um, it prevents other things from growing. So it's one of those things that you want to remove. If you shoot over the fence, you can see my, this is my strawberry patch here. Oh yeah. Um, which is pretty cool. And now, I like, uh, yeah, strawberries are, I love them, they're delicious. I have a question about the stilt grass. So when, when, I'm, when you pull it out and I have it in my hand right now, uh, what do you do with it? You have, yeah. Do you have to put it in a compost pile right away? You can't no, just leave it there, right? No, you don't want right? to put it in a compost pile. You don't? Because okay. Because compost, the purpose of compost is to spread back over your yard. Okay, right. So, so this, then you're going to propagate it. So I put that in a recycle bin. Okay, or, so I'll hold on to it. Yeah, All right. Yeah, All right. so we'll, we'll get rid of that. I've got some blueberry bushes back here. This is a this is a big fig tree. This is an apricot tree right over there. Oh, yeah. Um, so... There's a lot of plants that builders use routinely that are actually invasive species. And invasive means that they... Yeah, what does that mean? Invasive means that they are putting down a huge amount of seed and they're proliferating to, at the expense of plant diversity. So okay. you want a diverse environment. And if one thing is not native, then it's going to sort of overrun everything else. Yes. So I'm... One of the things that I ha had happened when I... Um, at the native plants was they put 40 different plants with all Latin names in my yard and so I've been sort of learning you know bit by bit which what plants were that I didn't already know mm -hmm. and there's an app on the phone that's kind of great it's called plant snap um, that basically is going to let you um, take a picture of usually a leaf I don't know if you can you probably can't see the uh, a little bit yeah. Okay, so this is, um, I'm going to show you how this works. Let's take a picture of it. And then hit done. And it's going to pull up the results. And is this, is, this is a, um, a beauty berry. It's, a, a la it's got really beautiful lavender leaves. It is sort of, it is a uh, spreader, and so you have to keep an eye uh, keep an eye on that. Mm. So one of the thoughts that I had was how to get neighbors engaged uh, and my thought is around uh, what I call a blueberry project, blueberry bush project. Mm. And so this year I added, these have been in for a year now, um, so I planted uh, blueberry bushes. So this tall one in the back, that's actually a high, high bush blueberry. and. Um, I've got two of the tall ones and then three of the short ones. Those are, that's an Ilex. That's going to be a different uh, native plant. Um, but the blueberry bushes, I wanted to have up and down the street for the neighbor's kids. So if the kids are oh, yeah. eating food from their yard, then I think people are going to start thinking about what they're putting down on their yard. Um, so you don't, I'll, sh I'll show you where the, the blueberry bushes are. This is kind of a neat plant here. You see this big one? I have no idea what that is. I haven't plant snapped it yet, but it's big and it seems to really love this environment. It looks like it could be edible. I'm not sure. <laughs> so I'm probably going to plant snap that after we leave. And, and you need to be sure. Goes. See how that's going. Yeah, so this is a, a native violet plant. It's going to have little purple flowers on it that come off that are violet and flower nature. They're um, edible and the leaves are edible as well. So that just kind of sprung up and so I'm gonna let that stay and I see a couple more of those kind of coming up too. Yeah, so these are heart, you see the heart-shaped leaves with uh, really deep veins in the heart-shaped leaves. And then sort of right next to that, that's, it's actually a wild strawberry plant called green and gold. It's got really beautiful uh, little gold, gold flowers. So every time of the year, there's kind of something of interest that's uh, that's blooming in the garden. That was sort of the purpose of the design. These are these are like a purple allium. They've got the big bulbs on the top. You're going to see a lot of, you know, it's an onion onion family. The you see the insects. There's these little butterflies on on those, um, and it gives a huge diversity. Right here, uh, next to that is a wild columbine. Those are also um, a native native plant, and those pretty much just came up. So. I see what comes up and try to identify it and then decide whether to hopefully let it stay. Um, this is what a... This is 
this is a, a blueberry bush. It's called a low bush blueberry, and it's actually um, going to look somewhat similar to like a uh, uh, Japanese. Uh, what do you call those? Um, some more foodscaping. This is a squash plant that's got uh, edible squash flower on it. Um, I haven't watered. I haven't been watering over the past um, probably a couple of weeks and I did install a sprinkler system to help get things started but the pur purpose of native plants is basically that they're able to uh, survive without water because they're native to the climate. Um, with climate change, all of the rules of gardening have sort of gone out the window because of the extreme temperatures, the heavy rainstorms. So, uh, you know, it's it's really a different time to be um, to be gardening. Yeah, so you see a lot of activity. There's there's always bees and butterflies. When I drove up, coming the other day, there was um, there was a sphinx moth here that's probably like two inches long and it actually looks like a little hummingbird with a really thick body and maybe half up to half a dozen uh, goldfinches at the same time so a lot of people put bird seed out and in bird feeders I used to do that and then when I started reading about uh, bird feeders are basically concentrated feeding zones for mm. insects mm. and so if you mm. have one bird that comes that's got uh, some type of um, infection, then it's going to spread to all of the birds that are eating at that feeder. So it's better to distribute seed or to have native plants that the animals can eat from the plant. Um, so the cone flowers are going to keep the seed there year round. And so, yeah. so this is Cori Those are, um, it's a yellow Coriopsis, and that's going to uh, fall blooming blooming plant. It's got sort of a feathery, uh, feathery looking leaf and there's a lot of those. That's probably had a harder time. I've got a lot of shade and then it gets sun later in the day. So um, some of these, you know, just trying to figure out what micro plant, uh, climb the plant, different plants sort of thrive in. See him? It's like brilliant. He's there. The, the in oh, there's a yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. He'll, he'll come back. We just need to the monarch catapetal. Yes. Yeah. This is a milkweed pod and basically it's called milkweed because it's it's got like a seed that is going to be carried by the wind. So these are the seeds that are coming off in my hand, some sort of self-seeding my own yard. But if you're letting these fly then the little wisps are going to take it, take it over, and um, I can show you some milkweed over my neighbor's yard that has grown over there. Um, this is the cone flower when before it's gotten the big seed pot on the top. You can see this one is sort of in the middle stage of it, and these are when it's completely dry. And this is what the this is what the goldfinches are going to be coming after this seed. Oh, there he is. See him? Yep. See the right there. So I don't know if you can see the goldfinch. That's actually going to be a male goldfinch. They're yes. really brilliant yellow, and you can probably watch him. He's he's fluffing himself out, and he's getting ready to have his um, his lunch there on the on the comb flower. Oh, he's coming closer. Yeah. And usually his mate is nearby. I'll usually see like pairs of them. And yesterday it looked like it was so cool when he he and probably a whole buddy came and had a buffet on the comb flowers. <sighs> So it's to me, it's just so much more exciting and interesting than sort of an expansive monocrop of green that doesn't really, and then has little soldiers of color. You know, this is just like an expanse of color and interesting things that where there's always something going on. There, there are two um, weeds that are pretty commonly thought of as weeds. This is actually, it's a succulent and it's called purslane. And I think of it as valuable. If you see how thick and fat the the mainstream is, that's purslane. And if you think of purse, P-U-R-S-E, that means valuable. It's valuable like a purse. There's another weed that looks like it that's actually called spurge. And it looks very similar, but 
uh, master gardener, you want to purge the spurge. So <laughs> think of spurge and purge. It's going to have a similar look, but flatter, flatter leaves, and that's actually going to be toxic. Okay, so um, if you watch uh, Dr. Greger and nutritionfacts.org, there was one ailment that uh, purslane was shown to completely eliminate all the symptoms um, of this autoimmune disease. So I just recommended that to one of our um, one of our customers who had that um, that affliction. So I think when you're selecting plants, it's good to be just as aware of where you're selecting your food. You want to know your provider. You know, if you're going to the farmer's market, you want to know the farmer and what their growing techniques are. If you're buying plants, usually from Home Depot or Lowe's, and especially if they're food plants, they're most likely going to have synthetic fertilizer and uh, herb herbicides or pesticides that are going to uh, basically cause your food to have to contain uh, trace amounts of those things. Um, Consumer Reports front page article was about um, buying organic and they went through and they tested all fruits and vegetables both the non-organic and then organic versions and some things like peaches and potatoes uh, some predominant amount like 65% of all the potatoes had worrisome amounts of toxic chemicals and they go on to explain the six chemicals that are particularly worrisome and they recommend that the, um, the uh, FDA actually abolish from our food supply so when you're searching for food plants and the concept of foodscaping is where you start incorporating uh, plants that you can eat in your, you know, in your yard. Um, so you definitely don't want to get those that have already been um, dosed with, um, with either uh, fertilizers that are going to be inside of the plant or things that have been sprayed on the outside. Okay, I'm trying to show you guys a spider web. There's a really big spider web right here. Gwen's on the other side of it right now. I don't know if you can see it. I can barely see it here, but I just asked Gwen if she keeps the spider webs, and she'll give you the answer here in a second. I'm just trying to move around so that you can see this. Here she is. Yeah, of course. I think I, I try to coexist, peacefully coexist with as many uh, insects as possible. I think, uh, you know, usually even in my house, if, it, if there's a spider in my house, it usually means that there's enough bugs there to sustain them. It's like if there's not enough bugs and the spider's usually going to die or go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, if it's in a place where it sort of creeps me out, I usually help them on their way out, uh, <laughs> outside. Um. Alright, so the garden here has been in place for about a year, a little over a year. What kind of changes have you noticed with wildlife in your yard? Uh, oops, let me, let me pause. All right, so with all this touring, looking around, this looks to me like a, a perennial flowering garden that attracts the proper wildlife, and it even gives you food, too, to eat in your own yard and requires very little maintenance. So, uh, Gwen, let us know, like, what, what kind of time frame does it take to get something like this going in your yard? You know, um, that kind of thing. It's, it's been fun to watch the wildlife come into the yard. I've got uh, black snakes that are three to four feet long that... I see uh, one snake that uh, usually when my garage door goes up, she's laying in the sun and then she goes into the hydrangea bushes. Uh, I have skinks, purple skinks, I have a, a rabbit or two, not uh, proliferating yet. Uh, and then box turtles, um, that uh, one box turtle actually laid eggs and I had maybe inch long box turtles that were uh, scattered around and my house backs up to a hundred year floodplain so I think they um, find that this is a beneficial environment and then they go back out into the woods. So this is pretty exciting. This is, these are the first mushrooms that I've started seeing in the yard and you can see that this is um, actually the fruit of fungi. Uh, fungi is actually a separate kingdom. It's not a plant and it's not an animal. Um, it's actually unto itself and provides a balance between the, these, these uh, mushrooms are going to have gills. Um, some don't have gills. We're actually uh, searching for the chanterelles these days in the woods. They have, they actually have more like veins instead of actual gills. And so we've been um, collecting the chanterelles. Uh, golden chanterelles are coming up right now. The cinnabar chanterelles are really um, bright red and they are about a quarter in diameter. So you always want to know what mushrooms you're looking for when you um, search for the mushrooms. But the mycelium, the more, there's a great movie called Fantastic Fungi, 
that talks about mushrooms being like the future of the world. Um, they're using mushrooms actually on oil spills and uh, to provide more um, benefit to the soil. So they're going to help decompose things uh, that are dead in the environment. So if you see limbs go down from trees or trees fall down, the uh, uh, fungi actually encase the plants, whether it's a mouse, a dead mouse, or uh, anything that dies in the woods. The, uh, fungi are going to basically break those things down into um, compost. We were going to talk a little bit about compost. The leaves from the trees are going to come down in a couple of months and I'll probably vacuum those up with a composter, so a mulching composter, and then spread those back down. So I'm continuing to enhance the soil. Um, so just to talk about the difference between dirt and soil. Dirt is dead soil. It's soil that's been depleted of all of the nutrients that are necessary to grow healthy food. And so when you look at the monocrops with um, corn and soybean, the predominant crops in the United States, they've been um, depleted of um, soil. So they have to put down um, pesticides and herbicides because the plants aren't strong enough to fend off the insects themselves. The plants are weak. Um, they're putting down, having to put down fertilizers to enhance the plants, which is not a normal state. If you think about, if you're eating healthy food, then you don't need to take supplements. And so that's basically what we've done because we've depleted the soil, then you've taken out these nutrients. So soil is full of living organisms. Organic, the concept of organic is based on soil being living. It's uh, microbes, bacteria, fungi, um, insect shells, worm poop, everything that goes into the soil is going to provide a nutritional uh, density and complexity that's going to enhance the uh, composition of the food that you're eating. So getting started is always just as easy as planting some seeds. I like to use the green fair containers that are actually made out of sugar cane. I put uh, soil in the containers, put down a lot of water, poke some seeds in there, and then after a few weeks of watering and when the seeds have sprouted, I can actually put them in a ground and make sure that they get a lot of water until they get established. So that's the inexpensive way to do it, is buying organic seeds and soil and uh, getting started on your own. You can create small beds that you can extend the beds every year. So. I like the concept of think big, start small, and then scale. And so as you find what your yard likes, um, um, I, I believe that, you know, sort of in concept to Mike's question about permaculture, it's good to put down a backbone of perennials, things that are gonna be there year after year. So you have sort of a backdrop, and then you start including food plants uh, integrated with those. So like the blueberry bushes, I have a raspberry bush over there. Um, you know, things that are going to squash, wild onions, it was kind of cool, I actually still have a few wild onions that are, that are popping up. Um, when the onion grows up, like here's, here's one right here, you can see this is a, this is a wild onion, um, that's just come here, most people usually pull those out of their yard. Um, when this turns brown, and usually it rains, and I can pull that up, and you're going to have a, a nice little onion on the bottom that you can use in cooking. Here's another one here. So these are all like different things that I can use um, to cook with. I, I like to give credit for the la landscape that I have. I hired, I actually heard a lecture at the Master Gardener program and then hired uh, Alyssa Mira who did the um, lecture on native plants to do my design. Um, she came to the yard, uh, walked through, and then basically came up with a native uh, plant uh, arrangement for the yard that would provide that color year-round and her sort of the, comp the composition of things that are high and things that are low and sort of pleasing, uh, pleasing to the eye. So it looks like it was done by design instead of just sort of ad hoc. So uh, I hired a, a company to actually put the plants in, and from here on out, it's on my own. Now I'm getting, I got a list of uh, 40 different Latin names, some I was familiar with, a lot that I wasn't. So 
now I'm sort of uh, engaging with my lawn and something new to learn about um, every day. There, there's a concept in uh, gardening called the food web and that basically has to do with the interconnectedness of everything that's growing uh, or living in the yard. And so the food web uh, talks about, uh, we talk about 98% of insects are gonna be good. And as a gardener, if you buy a chemical and decide that you wanna spray for uh, wasps, for example, then your tomato plants are gonna be overrun with aphids. And then you have to buy another chemical for the aphids. And so the concept of the food web is that everything in balance is gonna be uh, providing what you need when you need it. Uh, when man tries to take control, then usually we upset the food web or the balance of nature.